Hi, and welcome everybody to the session today, session 6B, which is on anti-corruption efforts. I'm very pleased uh, to see you all here. Uh, what is this evening uh, here in the UK? Um, my name is Professor Heather Marquette, and I am a professor in development politics at the University of Birmingham. I'm also seconded part-time to the UK's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office uh, as a Senior Research Fellow in Governance and Conflict, where among my responsibilities, um, I'm thinking about uh, investments in research on serious organized crime and anti-corruption. Um, and finally, I am very pleased to say that I'm a uh, expert uh, network member for the GI. Um, and uh, as I said, I'm very pleased to be here talking about anti-corruption this evening. Um, just to start out with a little bit of housekeeping on the agenda. Um, we have three speakers here uh, today, although we're waiting for one to, to log on. So we'll just be a little bit flexible on there. Um, and each of them will have 10 minutes for their presentation. And we'll do those sequentially. So just one after the other, and then we'll have at least 30 minutes then for Q and A. Um, I wanna suggest that people start putting their questions and comments in the chat bar, and we'll keep an eye on those uh, to bring those back to the, the speakers. Um, and then if we still have space, we'll uh, come back to the floor for questions and you can raise your hand using the hand function. Um, at that point, but but please start putting things in the in the chat bar first instead of waiting um, to the end. Ask as you ask as we go. Um, I think in keeping with the other sessions, please stay on mute unless you've been given the floor. And I think unless somebody tells me otherwise, I think that's all the um, the housekeeping that I really need for now. Um, before handing over to the speakers, I wanted to say with with anti corruption, it's interesting having worked in anti corruption for over twenty years. Seeing there have been handful, you know, a number of people, including uh, Jay Albanese, who's here, who've who've uh, long connected corruption and organized crime and anti corruption in their research, but they're more like siblings in some ways, and not always studied together using the same literatures and the same you know, with the same people or the same practitioners or so on. Um, you certainly can have corruption without organized crime, um, but it's very hard to imagine a situation where you would have organized crime without corruption. Um, I think it's really exciting to see anti-corruption in its own right coming into uh, conferences such as this and networks uh, such as uh, IISOC as well. Um, and it's great to see the synergies coming together between the literatures and, and the practice as well. Um, we have our three speakers tonight, and each of them is looking at a specific innovation in anti-corruption uh, practice. The first two um, will be looking at specific sectors and looking at it within country case study and sectors. And then we'll be going to a third who's going to look at it at the transnational level as well. So giving us a good spread of kind of country level and transnational as well as the, the different sectors too. And what I'd like to do is hand over to the first speaker. I'm gonna introduce all three um, right now and then we'll go uh, one by one. So the first speaker, we have King Carl Tornamduho, who's the research consultant with the Amani Center for Policy and Education in Ghana. And he's also a member of the Strategic Hub for Organized Crime Research, or SHOC, which I'm sure everybody knows of, at RUSI in the UK. Uh, Carl's research uses data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence to solve complex accounting, economics, and finance problems. And he's going to be talking to us tonight about anti-corruption disclosures as necessary evils with evidence from extractive firms in Africa. Carl's going to be followed by our second speaker, who's Wesley Mwafulurima, uh, who's with Kawelo Lawyers in Malawi. And Wesley is going to be talking to us about using public interest litigation to fight corruption in Malawi's public service. 
And then finally, we have Lorenzo Crepa, who's a PhD student at the Department of Government at the University of Essex in the UK. And he's also an associate lecturer in uh, the University College London, UCL, in the Department of Political Science. And his research focuses on multilateral cooperation to regulate corporate foreign bribery and variations in state capacity in order to hold corruptions accountable for exporting corruption. Um, so as you can see, three very important uh, areas to look at. Lorenzo is going to be talking to us about the conditional arm of the law and the effect of anti-bribery laws and corruption on foreign direct investment. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Carl for our first presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good morning, wherever you are. Yeah, good evening, once again. Uh, I'll be presenting this evening on anti-corruption disclosures as necessary evils, evidence from extractive firms in Africa. Uh, the next slide. Yeah, so this is the outline of the presentation, the next slide. Yeah, so corruption has been a critical issue with regards to uh, Africa's development. It deprives the continent of about 25% of its total GDP and uh, corruption has been defined as the abuse of power for personal gains. This could be in the public sector and the private sector. We see that a lot of literature has been capturing the private sector. Corruption has been defined as the abuse of power for personal gains. This could be in the public sector and the private sector. We see that a lot of literature has been capturing the private sector. Corruption has been defined as the abuse of power for personal gains. This could be in the public sector and the private sector. We see that a lot of literature has been capturing the private sector. Corruption has been defined as the abuse of power for personal gains. This could be in the public sector and the private sector. We see that a lot of literature has been capturing the private sector. Corruption has been defined as the abuse of power for personal gains. This could be in the public sector and the private sector. We see that a lot of literature has been capturing the private sector. Corruption has been defined as the abuse of power for personal gains. Uh, 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 industry where corruption is prevalent because of the nature of the, 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 the industry where the costs that are involved are huge. Next slide. Yeah, so there have been a number of uh, uh, initiatives that have emerged with regards to the accounting profession. While there are some uh, uh, efforts in the legal fraternity, the accounting profession has also tried to uh, 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 ensure that there's increased transparency and there's a need for accountability. And one of that is to ensure that there are disclosures that firms give out when it comes to the issue of corruption. And in spite of this, corruption continues to erode the African resources. Realize about thirty billion uh, uh, dollars each as a as, as a result of extraction of the, the the natural resources. So there are a lot of natural resources, and there's a need for 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 the, the, the accounting profession or research to be done on how corruption is, is addressed in the, in the in the industry. Next slide. Against this backdrop. Uh, uh, I was motivated as part of my uh, master's thesis and field thesis to explore the, the issue of anti-corruption, which has not been uh, 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 detailed in that uh, uh, in the African con context. And what I realized is that the the, the anti-corruption disclosure has been as as that Carl, can I just interrupt you for a second? Every every once in a while, you get a little bit of feedback, so I don't know if it's something with the speaker you're using. If if you're moving it around. Let me, let me check that up. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Is it okay? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Could you turn it up just a little bit? But that's that sounds a little bit better. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so as I was indicating, the anti-corruption issues has been, have been key, but the literature indicates, Dre et al. and other studies indicated that the African con context has not been explored with regards to the extractive industry. And there's much to be explored in, in that context. There are some studies that try to look at the key determinants of uh, anti-corruption disclosure, looking at it in the world level. That's Bachmeyer uh, 2015. Kimbrough also did a study on that. But a critical study about how the anti-corruption disclosure 
affects the performance indicators like the prof profitability or the financial stability of these uh, entities has not been uh, uh, explored in this way. Next slide. So against this backdrop, this study aims to uh, examine three key research questions. First is to examine the effect of anti-corruption disclosures on profitability, to examine the effect of anti-corruption disclosure on financial stability, and then to explore whether there's convergence uh, where over time is the practice being, be, being uh, uh, imitated from uh, other uh, the, 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 the firms that are not able to do much with in that regard. Next slide. Carl, again, you're just a little bit soft. If you could just speak up a bit. This is the conceptual framework. This is the conceptual framework of the study. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the effect of the anti-corruption disclosure on the profitability, the effect on the financial stability, and then looking at the convergence. The next slide. Uh, so there have been a number of studies, as I indicated. There are a few studies that explore the, 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 the linkage with the financial performance. For example, who et al. 2019 indicated, found that the level of anti-corruption effort in the country uh, affects the stability of firms operating in the jurisdiction, but this is in the banking sector and not in the extractive industry. The next slide. Yeah, similarly, Chen et al. 2015 also found evidence to suggest that corporate social responsibility indicators have a positive correlation with return on uh, equity. That's profitability indicator. Uh, the next slide. So you, you find in the literature that uh, 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 there are some level of uh, relationship. So Chen et al. 2015, uh, another study concluded that corruption has a positive effect on the risk behavior of firms. Past this study has been scattered across, there have not been a critical analysis for the uh, African con con continent. The next slide. So this study uses the, use the institutional theory to try to look at what the firm, the firm factors, the country level factors, and global pressures that uh, 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 drive the performance, including the, 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 the effect of the anti-corruption disclosure uh, uh, by the, the firms. The next slide. So I, I went through a database from the Global Reporting Initiative of the Sustainability Re Report, which are uh, uh, presented based on the GRI framework. And uh, I pulled out a sample of 220, and then I organized them in a binary coding where they have disclosed on anti-corruption issues or they have not. Uh, the next slide. Yeah, so there are three key indicators that firms have, have to disclose when it comes to the anti-corruption uh, issues. The first one is whether the firms have done cor corruption analysis. The second one is whether they have disclosed on their corruption training and corruption com communications that they give. And the third one is whether they have uh, uh, disclosed on corruption responses. The next slide. Yeah, so there are a number of uh, variables that I've, I've explored, firm level, country level, and then global level. Global level like the United Nations Global Compact, and then uh, another one like the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, the Human Development Index of the firms, and then uh, of, of the countries, and then, and then other variables. The next slide. So I developed an index out of these three uh, indicators, whether that's computed binary, whether they have disclosed or they are not disclosed. The next slide. And so I tried to develop a, a regression analysis that tried to uh, regress the, 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 the effects that anti-corruption disclosure have on the financial indicators. That's return on assets, return on equity, and financial stability measured by the the Z score. The next slide. Okay. So another thing also that I did is that I tried to look at the convergence where uh, in the economics literature, there have been a study on studies on how uh, uh, the, the economic growth converges among countries and all of that. So I tried to use that model to try to see how the disclosure pattern converges. So I use the index in this case and see how they have converged over time. The next slide. So this is the descriptive statistics of the data set that I have, I've computed, I've, 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 I've obtained. And you see that the, the mean disclosure out of from zero to one, one meaning that they have disclosed, zero meaning they have not disclosed. You see that the, the, the disclosure uh, means are all below 50%. 
which shows that not majority of the, the firms are disclosing in the African context when it comes to corruption. They may disclose on their pure financial items, pure financial indicators, but when it comes to anti-corruption issues, they are not disclosing so much. The next slide. I tried to check the, the multi-culinary issues and then could do some correlation analysis as well. The next slide. Now, this is the next slide. This is the result of the, the, the study trying to see the effect of anti no back trying to see the effect of anti corruption disclosure on the corruption uh, on the performance indicators. And I saw that the anti corruption disclosure as a composite index does not have effect on the profitability that's the return on asset and the return on equity, but it has a negative effect on the financial stability, which means that firms that tend to disclose their anti corruption issues tend to have lower. Uh, financial stability and you see that it is being driven by two of the indicators the disclosure on corruption risk analysis and then the disclosure on corruption training and co co competition and then when you look at it there are other firm level and uh, country level uh, indicators you see that a critical one is the united nations global compact which has a positive effect on the profitability return on assets and uh, stability which means that the firms that are signatories to the united nations global compact tend to have better performance uh, as, as, as there are some, some, some speci specifics when, when it comes to them joining that uh, they, they disclose certain things in the annual report and they are supposed to uh, comply with some best practices when as, as, as regards to the Carl, just two more minutes. The next slide. The next slide. And so uh, I also conducted a beta convergence analysis and a sigma convergence analysis and I found that what uh, the, the performance, the, the disclosure of these firms or their performance converge over time, which means that the firms are able to imitate the various practices uh, among each other. So firms that disclose and the ones that do, do not disclose, the ones that do not disclose tend to copy the ones that disclose over time. And which means that the various initiatives or the institutions that develop these sustainability disclosure indicators or anti-corruption indicators need to engage these firms as much as possible so that they will be able, be able, able to imitate and copy and then try to also disclose the next slide. The next slide. Yeah, so in summary, the study found that, found that the firms have a course when, when it comes to disclosing their anti-corruption uh, issues, it sends a negative signal which may reduce the bottom line. By the way, doing an anti-corruption risk analysis comes with a cost then doing the corruption training and corruption communication also comes with the cost, which means that the, the, for us to really achieve a, the, the needed fight in the African context when it comes to anti-corruption issues, the board level, the C-suite executives need to be deeply involved so that even when it comes at a cost, they'll be able to, 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 to drive it and disclose as much as possible. The next slide. And so we also find that found that there are firm, firm level factors like the size, the financial level, cross listing, United Nations Global Compact membership, the extractive industry transparency, international membership, and then multinational status, industry level, uh, corruption perception index, human development index. All of these factors also drive uh, uh, the, 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 the performance or the stability of the, of the firm. We see that there is the convergence among the firms, suggesting that there's the flow of best practices in the industry that reduce the disparities in the performance of the firms when it comes to either profitability or stability or the anti-corruption disclosure. The next slide. Okay, Carl, can you just wrap it up, please? Yes. So in conclusion, uh, the study co co uh, contributes to the existing literature, indicating that the, the needed expectation that we have for us to ensure that anti-corruption issues are inculcated in the annual report have to come from a multi-stakeholder engagement from the institutions level, the country level, and the global level. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, like I said, everybody, if you could save questions for the end, but um, you feel free to put questions in the, the chat as we go along, but we'll save any floor questions till the end. Thank you. We're going to be going over to Wesley talking about public interest litigation, fighting corruption in Malawi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, 
unfortunately, I, 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 I hope you are, you, are, you are all able to hear me. Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. All right. Um, unfortunately, I can't see my presentation. I think it will be streamed from that end. Uh, we can see the slides here. Okay, yeah, so the, uh, I can also see now my, I'll be very brief. The presentation actually is a narrative from my own personal experience, having done a lot of uh, public litigation on uh, corruption, um, against corruption in Malawi. And uh, I just want to share with the, uh, with the group my experiences and the lessons that we have learned and the potential that is the, if we use strategic public in this litigation to fight uh, financial crimes, especially public corruption. So uh, if you can go to the next slide. Now, uh, in Malawi from around 2016, there was a rise in you know, uh, uh, civil, uh, um, there was a rise in public interest litigation against public corruption. And the two cases that are very, were very fundamental were the, what was called the Mens Gate case, and the other one was called the, a, the Tractor Gate case. So if you can go to the next slide. Now, in the Mens Gate case, what happened was that uh, there was a, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, he was involved in a, some dubious transaction involving purchase of maize from our neighboring country, Zambia. Uh, it was very clear that uh, there was a corruption involved in, uh, in terms of how the maize was procured. But the, being a minister, the president was not willing to prosecute him criminally. I got instructions from civil, uh, some civil activists went to court, got orders, um, an interrogatory order to suspend him pending uh, investigation. It was one of his kind. We had, I had no precedent, not even uh, from other regions. And um, I mean, when we went to the uh, Supreme Court, we, we lost the case. There were cost orders against my clients and I've, I'm now litigating uh, that at the um, uh, African court uh, in Arusha. But, what we realized was that after this case, the Western things were done completely changed. So we did achieve the results. And also we were later on vindicated. Although we lost at the Supreme Court, we managed to influence a, a, a commission of inquiry, which uh, uh, did conclude that the, the minister was probably wrong and he was criminally prosecuted. But unfortunately with the political environment, he was acquitted. Um, the next slide. Then the other case was the what we call the tractor gate case. This one involved also some dubious transactions, misprocurement of uh, tractors from India. Um, the ombudsman also was very vigilant. He did pursue, she did pursue the matter until the um, um, the Supreme Court agreed with her, and the the uh, public officials which, who were involved were also uh, brought to justice. So if you can go to the next slide. Now, those are some of my clients who, as you can see, uh, the one, the one was, the other guy was confronting with the police. Um, so you can do the, go to the next slide. Now, the, the theoretical basis is a concept called deep democratization. Now, in a very simple term, the, the concept of deep deep democratization involves the citizens. So you are pretty much saying, if the citizens are not active to demand an end to account, an end to impunity, then they will not, there won't be any change. And this is very important, especially for third world countries like mine, like Malawi, where you know, democratic values and principles are not as respected. Next slide. And also um, some of the cases from Malawi were highly motivated by a jurisprudence, especially from India. Those two cases that I've cited, they're very important. Um, those cases 
uh, in terms of uh, using public investigation to uh, to fight corruption, they made very interesting um, orders and uh, uh, and set the, the the tone in India, where they even made orders where you know the court would make a supervisory orders, for example, where um, uh, the court would say, okay, if the, if the state is failing to investigate a, a, a corrupt activity, then they will order the state agent agency to uh, uh, investigate and report to the court and so on and so forth. They might vote count case. Uh, the last one is a South African case, which I used in a, a subsequent case, which I actually we are doing very well. Uh, it's pretty much about um, accountability in, in, in political funding. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So, uh, because of those two first two cases, we managed then to also take up another case called the Brunei case, which is now at a very advanced stage, and we have been winning. That one we are fighting. We were fighting, and also represented the clans there, where we are fighting, um, you know, dubious funding of uh, political parties, especially the ruling parties through uh, from uh, public institutions. So we took up the, the, the case and we were motivated by the my vote count case, which was in the previous slide. Um, and, and the court so far has been agreeing with us. The ESCOM demolition building case is where the ESCOM is our electricity supply uh, public institution. And uh, there was, they awarded, it did award a, a contract to demolish one of these buildings. And the, and the amount was just out of this world, it was over a million US dollars, uh, a very simple building, which arranged it through a, a litigation and we won the case because we said, you know what, they, 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 it was dubious and they most likely there was corruption and we succeeded. And there are also so many other cases that we have taken up um, and I've represented my clients uh, in public litigation and we have managed to, uh, to fight public corruption. And if you can go to the next slide. Now we've, we've we started this project about uh, four years or so ago, and uh, taking up these cases, we have learned a few lessons. And the key to those lessons are that um, uh, if you would reduce legal barriers, for example, a stringent uh, local standard rules, um, and also you have an active civil society, um, the use of strategic public interest litigation has got a huge potential to reduce public corruption. Next slide. Um, now, the other thing is also the courts. If you may have uh, um, very active, vibrant so uh, civil society, uh, very good uh, uh, rules, a, a liberal constitution, uh, but then if, you, if the courts are not as independent, and we have noticed this, for example, in Zimbabwe, um, you may not get good results actually out of a strategy public interest litigation. And for some of you, maybe you may wish to know that our five judges uh, were awarded the, the Chatham House, the Chatham House Prize this year for 2020 for being so independent. And they ruled, they made a, a very uh, landmark ruling against um, um, uh, electoral rigging. The next slide. So in conclusion, uh, because of time, I would say there is huge potential in using strategic public interest litigation to fight public corruption. And Malawi is one good example where that has been done. And I'm so happy that I've been involved in most of these cases um, at the risk sometimes of my life, uh, first death threats and so on and so forth. But I'm so happy to say that I've helped to contribute to fight co public corruption in my country through use of strategic public interest litigation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Wesley. Really interesting. And I, I think that's a, a great point of a distressing one there, that uh, fighting corruption depends on people uh, sacrificing a, a great deal and putting themselves in discomfort, if not danger. So thank you for that. And, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, Lorenzo, I think we'll be handing over to you for our last of three presentations. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so let me share my screen. Can you can you see it? 
I can. Thanks. Uh, okay, that's great. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I've tried to keep my presentation short and uh, I've tried to concentrate mostly on um, policy implications rather than the uh, more scholarly side. So let me start by introducing the, uh, the puzzle, uh, the reason why I decide to study uh, what I do. So, um, you know, states uh, have adopted policies uh, to prosecute their firms for bribing abroad. So, and as I'm sure uh, most of the audience uh, knows, uh, this was not the case before uh, a certain point uh, in the 90s where states decided to take seriously um, the, uh, the effort to um, halt uh, foreign bribery, right? And um, as, a, as a meaningful example, uh, the 1997 OECD Anti-Bribery Convention compels 44 signatory countries to adopt similar laws. So right now in these, I mean, after the ratification of this, uh, of this convention in these countries, it's become a crime to, uh, to pay bribes uh, abroad. The problem is that um, some uh, works, especially in economics, uh, criticize these policies for placing a heavy burden on firms. So the idea would be that these policies uh, would represent a cost when firms decide whether to invest abroad and would undermine foreign investment. And this would be bad because um, we know that uh, foreign direct investment, FDI, has positive development effects uh, in corrupt economies. Yet my claim is that uh, in, this, in this study that at least under some conditions, these policies can prove advantageous to firms. And this is at least what, I'm, what I try to uh, show uh, tonight. So in principle, two competing effects uh, for, uh, exist for these policies on, uh, on investment uh, by firms. Uh, on the one hand, there's like the more traditional argument that these policies deter investments because they regularize uh, expectations of firms about cost of, prose of prosecution. At the same time, uh, firms know that they will be uh, more likely to be demanded bribes in uh, corrupt countries and all else equal, this should uh, deter firms to invest uh, from investing in corrupt economies. At the same time, I can at least uh, find another argument um, uh, stating the contrary, in fact. I call this argument empowerment, right? So the idea here, here is that in, in fact, anti-bribery policies provide a legal ground for firms to refuse bribe requests from, um, from uh, public officials, from corrupt public officials abroad. This would improve their bargaining position and uh, would allow firms to cut bribery costs. So would, it would make investments more efficient. So all else equal, they should facilitate uh, these policies should facilitate firms' investments in corrupt economies. So I, I'm, I'm, I was looking for a for a way to square these two opposite um, arguments. And uh, my claim, the claim that I make uh, in my in my article here, is that both uh, poles, both both forces are at play simultaneously, and that the net effect between the two of them depends on the level of corruption of the host country. Because because we know that the bargaining power of public officials, so the, 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 the operating space for public officials to demand bribes increases uh, in it. So what I expect is that the effect of these policies on uh, investments will be null in very clean economies, positive in mildly corrupt economies on a mid-level scale uh, where, where uh, empowerment would prevail and negative uh, in extremely corrupt economies where deterrence uh, would prevail uh, because here the idea would be that uh, these policies do not prove uh, advantageous to firms, do not provide a legal ground to refuse bribe requests. So now I, I decided not to go into much details on the econometrics uh, and the statistics of, of the model that I used to test this expectation. Um, just to give you some, um, some elements, I model uh, data on uh, individual firms' uh, investment decisions, uh, more than 3,000 firms' investment decisions. And um, I explain these decisions uh, using an indicator for whether the home country ratified the convention uh, or not. I choose 2005 because it's at the beginning of my, of my uh, data set. So um, I show that this effect depends, depends on the level of corruption of the host country. And I use a, 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 an innovative index of corruption, which is non-perception based. Um, perception based indexes, as I'm sure uh, many, many here knows, um, they've been criticized over and over uh, by the literature and I decided to take this, um, this uh, criticism seriously. And in a few words, uh, this is 
basically what I find. Um, so in this plot, you can see on the y axis the change in the probability that um, that a firm invests uh, abroad uh, when uh, when it becomes subject to anti-bribery policies. So this line here represents uh, what happens to the probability of investing when a firm uh, becomes subject to anti-bribery policies. And on the x-axis, you have the level of corruption of the host country. So what do we observe? We observe that for very, very clean countries here, the effect of these policies is negligible. It's very, very small. And this makes sense, right? Um, because this, these countries are, are very clean. It's, it's very unlikely that firms will be demanded bribes here. Now, as the, as the host country becomes more corrupt, these uh, policies prove advantageous and uh, firms have up to a maximum of roughly 40% uh, increase in the probability of investing in these countries. And here we're talking more or less uh, of a country like, um, like Singapore, um, just, to, just, to, just to make sure, just to be clear. And then as the country becomes even more corrupt, this probability is still positive, but declines. And it becomes negative for extremely corrupt, uh, for extremely corrupt economies. So my argument is that here, as long as the curve is, um, is above the zero uh, empowerment, the empowerment effect prevails. And here, instead, um, deterrence would prevail. Now, the effect is robust to a bunch of uh, further tests uh, that I've introduced. I, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Of, of course, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about any methodological issue and literally anything else in the Q&A. Um, I just would like to uh, stress that I also use other data sources uh, at the country level, uh, at the country level um, and that I use also more traditional indexes uh, of corruption for the host country. What I would like to focus on uh, instead are the uh, conclusions, uh, especially the policy implications uh, of this study. So um, what I find is that uh, OECD anti-bribery policies do affect firms' investment decisions uh, abroad, in, but in a non-linear way, in a non-univocal way. They have no ex effect in extremely clean economies. Uh, they prove advantageous in mildly corrupt countries. And I would like to stress this result because to my knowledge, I haven't seen this uh, much in the in the in the literature, at least in the empirical literature, and they prove disadvantages in extremely corrupt uh, economies. So the two main takeaways here is that these policies need not penalize firms uh, necessarily abroad, and that I would like to uh, raise some skepticism about the concerns on the anti-business nature of uh, of these policies. At the same time. A serious policy concern that emerges here is that these policies clearly pull firms away from extremely corrupt economies. If I can come back to this to this plot, here what we see is that firms subject to anti-bribery policies are definitely less likely to invest in extremely corrupt economies. So what this means is that, and, and with this one I will I would like to conclude, is that these countries will be left exposed to, most likely will be left exposed to investments uh, from firms uh, that come from countries without anti-bribery standards. So the risk here, the, the, the sincere concern that, uh, that I think this, this uh, exercise uh, shows is that uh, the risk to be, to, 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 to be a, a kind of a vicious circle where uh, dirty firms, if you want, uh, tend to invest more in dirty uh, economies. And this uh, tends, to, tends to be the conclusion of two uh, very brilliant uh, recent uh, works that I've uh, included here. And uh, I tried to keep it as brief as possible, but of course, um, I'm, I'm happy to go through any, any question uh, in the Q&A. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Lots to, to think about there. Um, please start putting any questions in the chat, or I think we can also have raised hand, uh, raised hands as well. Um, so I'm just I can't see the um, I can't see uh, the gallery yet. So have a look. Um, I wanted just before we do that, I just wanted to say I mean I was thinking about with the the three different speakers. I mean three um, interesting and very different presentations, but uh, some things that connected for me across all three is. Firstly, when it comes to anti-corruption, um, I think all three 
presentations gave a real sense for the complexity um, in what has to happen in terms of tackling corruption and also the importance of context as well in anti-corruption interventions and the fact that uh, isomorphic mimicry is a real challenge um, in trying to take anti-corruption interventions from one context into another. I think a second one for me is the real challenge of tackling corruption in the private sector, not just the public sector where, where a lot of anti-corruption research sits, um, and that the private sector has some really uh, interesting and challenging incentives that uh, create challenges for anti-corruption uh, in themselves. Um, I think thirdly, the, the challenge when corruption in private sector firms hits power and political actors as well. Um, and obviously there's the danger of fighting corruption, but how you actually do it when you have the sort of a powerful business on the one hand and, uh, and also a, um, sorry, I need to turn that on, and also uh, powerful political actors as well. And then you have poor anti-corruption actors somewhere in the middle. Um, in what is a highly technical, but also a very political exercise. Um, so I have a couple of questions for each of the speakers and just to see as well, if people would like to ask questions. Um, I'm gonna jump in with Chair's prerogative and start with, with Carl. If I could ask you um, a couple of questions here. Firstly, um, you, you gave us a lot of data, which was fantastic. And I was just wondering if you could just say uh, just a couple of things. I mean, not, not too long, but something about the, the diversity of what you found given you were looking at African firms. So um, did it make any difference whether you were talking about extractives, oil versus non-oil, foreign companies versus domestic or hybrid, uh, the political economy of the environment? Were there, were there any variables that jumped out at you as, as uh, being outliers or significant there? And um, the second question that I had really is, is um, what recommendations come out of the research? Because it it's, strikes me as being really challenging if I were to try to translate that to a policymaker. Uh, what would you recommend anti-corruption actors do differently on that? I think for Wesley, if I may, um, sort of, uh, I'll just do all three and then let you let you come to questions there. Um, just a couple of questions. I mean, one one thing that really struck me when you're talking is that you know here in the UK, the levels of corruption around procurement in the COVID sector is pretty astonishing. Um, and it gets worse every day. And uh, there's a, a law firm that's bringing the government to court uh, on corruption, to look at corruption cases. And I saw a webinar recently where the, the lawyer in charge said that when all other institutions fail, what you have left is the courts. And so I just wanted to ask you, um, what special role do you think public interest litigation plays, especially in contexts where corruption involves powerful pol political actors? Uh, is it a last resort? Um, and, and if so, in countries with weak uh, judicial institutions, um, what, what would you recommend? And finally, for Lorenzo, um, I mean, really, really interesting. I was wondering if you could share, firstly, uh, just examples, one or two countries in that extremely corrupt category, because I, I was struck by, you know, whether it is that um, investment is low anyway, um, because of the, the challenges in what I would think of as being extremely corrupt countries, so uh, lacking in infrastructure and so on to attract investment. Um, but also, how much do you think is perceptions? So relatively clean companies just, just believing that bribery is normal, so they don't even bother. Is there something about experiences um, or perceptions preceding investment. So Carl, if I go over to you first and then we'll we'll go along and then uh, go out to the floor. I can see one there for from uh, Ben already. Yes, thank you very much. Those are very great questions. Now, first one with regards to the differences, what I did is that I tried to compact, uh, stratify the data set into the energy firms and the mining firms and try to see the level of the disclosure. And I saw that the energy firms tend to disclose more 
about the anti-corruption issues in the African context. But then I tried to run a, a Kruskawalis analysis, trying to see whether there's statistically significant difference among them. But I saw that those are not statistically dif different, so not so uh, significantly different. Uh, then with regards to the policy implications, here we are seeing that firms are disclosing on the anti-corruption issues and it's affecting the way that their performance is, the way their financial stability is. What th that means is that there's a need for multi-stakeholder engagement when it comes to the fight against corruption, such that in the uh, institutions like the UN, uh, 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 institutions like the Extractive Industry Transformation Initiative, like the United Nations Global Compact, and the other in in initiatives, they have to all come together, work very close with the, the, the executives of these organizations, and then ensure that these things uh, uh, trickle down to the organizations to ensure that the fight is really within. Then also, uh, th there is the need for the, 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 the accounting profession or the, the, the various professional institutions to inculcate uh, uh, and push more for, for the fight against corruption. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Leslie. Thank you. Now, I think Carl just mentioned something very important. He mentions of a much, much sectoral approach. I, I, I agree with, with him. Um, I mean, going to your question, uh, what happens if you are, if the courts themselves are not as uh, vigilant, are not as independent, this, the institutions are not strong, would public interest litigation still be a viable option? I think that was your question. My view is if the courts are not as strong, then that's where you need a very strong civil, uh, civil society. A very good example is the case that I, I referred you to, the Mesgate case, was one of the first cases that I handled. The courts were so compromised the chief justice slapped my client with a, a personal cost order to, to pay. I, we mobilized civil society. I ended up taking the matter all the way to the regional court, Arusha, where I got um, an order restraining the Malawi government from executing or declaring my, my client bankrupt for not paying about 20 million quarter. I mean, almost uh, 50,000 US dollars. And, uh, and, you know, because of that pressure, we gave so much pressure on the, on, the, on, on the judiciary that no, we are watching and the international community is watching and there was a bit of change. Uh, so, uh, but at the same time, I mean, I've got uh, an extreme example of Zimbabwe, as I said, where the civil society is really also working very hard and, and, and it's not working. The, the, the judiciary is, is not as independent. So yeah, there is a, I mean, it's, it's a very good point that sometimes if the judiciary is not working, it's very hard. Um, but in our case, what we did was when the judiciary was not as independent, we still fought. That's a really, really good point. Thank you very much. And Lorenzo. Yeah, uh, thank you, other like very, very good uh, questions. So, um, so about the first one, uh, you say, um, well, like, uh, what are some examples of countries in like the extremely corrupt category? So uh, at the at the right hand. Um, at, at, the, at the very right hand uh, side of the of the axis, I have um, countries like Russia, India, and Kazakhstan. So you know, like countries that tend to attract uh, investments. In any case, perhaps they might be less um, less attractive uh, than than uh, than than other more more advanced economies from some points of view. But they tend to attract investments, especially in extractive industries. And indeed, something that I find that I, I had no time to show uh, tonight is that the um, the effect uh, that I uh, that I'm talking about holds only in uh, sectors that are typically uh, like um, extractive industries or sectors that are typically subject to uh, bribery and not uh, in other sectors. And um, so, and I think this also speaks to, uh, to the second point uh, that you were raising. Uh, again, a, a very good one. Um, so you were saying, isn't it the case that um, this simply reflects some kind of a perception by firms, uh, whereas like very clean firms would avoid extremely corrupt uh, economies? And that might be the case. Uh, at the same time, um, the fact I'm, 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 I think I can I find some some element in support of my of my of my mechanism um, 
in when in the moment where I see that uh, sectors typically subject to bribes are the ones uh, where where this uh, where this effect where this uh, logic uh, holds, and also that if uh, if it were a perception uh, thing with cleaner firms going to invest in cleaner countries and vice versa, then what I would uh, observe uh, would be a linear effect, uh, if you know what I mean, um, and not this uh, nonlinear, like quadratic or, or a parabola shaped uh, effect. So, um, so I think like this, this kind of gives some elements uh, in support to this. Excellent, thanks. I'm just sitting there thinking about how I don't think we talk enough about unintended consequences of anti-corruption policies themselves and whether or not anti-bribery legislation means that countries end up getting stuck in a low investment environment. Um, yeah, that, exactly. That, that, yeah, if I can, that, that was exactly my concern, uh, my main concern uh, at the end of my, of my exercise. Excellent, thanks. We have a, we have a general question here from Ben uh, Carpentier which is, and it says to everyone, and it looks like the kind of question that any of the speakers are welcome to answer. And then uh, something from Dick uh, Stolhurst uh, specifically for Lorenzo. I think Ben has asked a, a, actually a, a question that feeds on really nicely from that, which is you know, when you have anti-corruption interventions that are effective where there's sort of mild corruption or a good independent judiciary, notwithstanding Wesley's point about still fighting, even if institutions aren't strong. What do we do with countries where things are really bad and who is best placed to try and change things in these countries? So Wesley, can I actually go to you to answer that question first? What should anti-corruption actors prioritize in highly corrupt, uh, environments with really weak institutions. Okay, I, as part of my my master's thesis, um, I explored the notion of deep the deep democratization as used in the anti-corruption. Uh, I am of the view that the notion of deep deep democratization uh, stems from the very fact that you know anti-corruption methods should start bottom up, you know, it should be a bottom up approach, it should come from the citizens. I've, I've, I've always believed that uh, there's nothing more powerful than the voice of the citizens. Where, where you have even a weak institutions, where you've got, I mean, dicta dicta dictatorship and anything, uh, I am of the view that uh, where the citizens have got a very strong voice, whether the civil society or, or something like that, it always, in my view, works sooner or later. And very good examples, you could, uh, you know, the Arab Springs, for example, um, and so on and so forth. So I think in my view, my, 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 my humble opinion is where your institutions are very weak, uh, the judiciary is not independent, it's very corrupt as well. Uh, if the voice of the citizens comes out clearly and make a clear statement that they have had enough I think you sooner or later are bound to have a change. Excellent, thanks. I might come back to you first, but I wanna to go to Carl and then I'm gonna ask Dick if he could um, just speak his question for Lorenzo. So Carl, did you have anything to add to what Wesley just said about uh, priorities in really challenging environments from your research? Yes, uh, for me, uh, Beyond the judiciary's work, corruption happens at the micro level, at the individual level. And uh, for those uh, uh, contests that corruption is uh, uh, very high, there's the need for a mindset change. And that could be in a form of uh, educational, uh, uh, the, the teaching system should be able to inculcate uh, 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 various ethical concerns, eth ethical education issues, uh, and then uh, there should be multi-stakeholder multi, multi uh, because it's just not one side. It may be a private sector where it may be a public sector where the judiciary, the government sector, the government is involved, but part of the individual level where, where the, the, the corruption still persists. So for me, I see it, sh it should be a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, approach. 
Okay, thanks. Um, do I want to come back to you, but I'm going to hand over to Dirk. Uh, Dirk, did you have a question that you'd like to ask Lorenzo? You said that his presentation resonated with him. Uh, thanks, Heather. Yes, look, uh, I work as a risk specialist in Somalia. We're helping more than 20 UN agencies with a considerable amount of money that is poured into Somalia. Uh, and unfortunately, a, a fair percentage of that uh, is diverted. And uh, we, Somalia holds the dubious distinction of being the, uh, of ranking at the bottom of uh, Transparency International's uh, most corrupt countries in the world. I think we've had the record now for 13 years. And, and that's something that the international community should really hang its head in shame, in, in my view, uh, because obviously it's the international community that, that bears responsibility for it. Uh, so th just this week alone, uh, a well-respected Italian NGO called Intersos has announced that it will depart Somalia. And uh, that's, uh, that's of great concern to us. And no doubt uh, the reasons that uh, Lorenzo gave for these things happening uh, rings true to me. Um, the more we put pressures or the more the donor countries put pressures on, on companies to comply with uh, UNCAC and OECD anti-bribery legislation, et cetera, the, uh, the more layers of uh, checks and balances we put on these companies, uh, the, the more pressure they come to bear. And, and eventually we, uh, we lose the good ones. And uh, to quote Lorenzo, the, only the dirty businesses end up working in, in these countries. So it's insightful for me and I will reach out to Lorenzo. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Uh, do we have any more questions for the speakers? I wanted to um to just come in because it, it struck me listening to um, actually Dirk uh, and Carl and Wesley that there's quite a lot within the anti-corruption uh, research community right now about whether or not indirect approaches are better than direct approaches. So direct approaches carrying risks and unintended consequences. So that aligns really nicely um, with what we just heard. Maybe nicely is not the right, right way to put it. It's challenging, but thinking about not, not fighting corruption directly. Um, I have something coming out with a colleague of mine, Karen Pfeiffer, with a, a new framework looking at uh, corruption's functionality as well. And um, in line with the indirect approaches, not necessarily starting with fighting corruption as your starting point. Um, but I wanted to put, put out to you, because thinking about the, the idea of education and collective action and citizen engage, citizen engagement and so on on corruption, whether it's with the private sector or civil society or donors or whatever it is, there's some real challenging research right now about how difficult that that is in practice. Um, and two pieces of research that spring to mind. One is research around collective action and norms and thinking about this idea of corruption being normal and how people internalize the idea that this is how you just get things done. Um, and so they don't believe anybody else uh, is as upset about corruption as they are. They assume that everybody else is just happy to go along with things and that perpetuates it. Um, and with that in mind, there's this other research around corruption messaging, and it's taken place in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Nigeria, and Costa Rica so far. And, and they've found exactly the same thing, that if you use education or corruption messaging, uh, it increases the likelihood people will pay bribes and it decreases their willingness to fight corruption because it perpetuates the sense that corruption is a problem uh, and it's normal and it's the way things are done. And that brings real challenges to the, the thought of how you engage civil society, how civil society engages and where education comes in as well. Um, so I'd like to, to hand that to Lorenzo, but first there's a question here as well on what do you suggest a good alternative to the anti-bribery policies would be for the most corrupt countries? Yeah, I think I think your your point, Heather, and this uh, and this question uh, really square with each other. And I'm afraid, and 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 they and probably they also speak to to Dirk's uh, point um, and, and concern before. So I'm afraid I I I don't think I have an answer uh, to this uh, to this question, uh, or at least 
I mean, this is a very, very good question and, uh, and a very um, uh, challenging one. So I think, so my, my view on this is that, uh, you know, like, um, and, and so th these policies that uh, home states impose on their firms uh, when they when they do business abroad, in a way, it's it, it's it's necessary that uh, the states uh, try to hold their corporations responsible uh, for uh, for what happens abroad. So I'm not um, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that um, that you know that they're a bad thing. Um, what I think. So, so my, my opinion on this, and and this goes a bit beyond my my the the, the empirics uh, of my paper, but my opinion on this is that they're probably not um, not sufficient. So um, even like like taking into consideration was what also Heather was saying uh, a moment ago. Um, if the responsibility of uh, of the international community is just in ensuring. Uh, that comp the, the way the companies behave uh, is according to some um, to some um, goals uh, commonly com commonly accepted. That's probably not going to be enough. So there's probably more the need of a of a, of, of building uh, communities uh, locally uh, where the where a culture uh, of anti of anti corruption uh, develops. Uh, I, I do understand that this is like the most probably the more challenging uh, part, even more than setting up, um, than setting up uh, corporate, corporate standards. Um, but, it, but in general, uh, I think it's important that we stress the limits uh, of some of these standards, uh, even if we don't get to the point of say, of, of you know, uh, casting them, throwing them in the, in the, in the trash uh, in total. Thank you. Ben's just put a really interesting comment here about another session that dealt with this issue and thinking about corruption messaging, but positive mes messaging that rewards integrity has a much stronger power to promote cultural shift. C Carl, can I ask you this about this? I know that the UK government has been investing in a business integrity initiative, and certainly there are a number of different initiatives, including EITI, um, which has started focusing on anti-corruption more, but also thinking about integrity. Is this something that you think with firms that you've studied, would a focus on integrity make a difference? And if so, how? Well, uh, for that, the, the, the firms tend to uh, aim for legitimacy and the board and the uh, key management will tend to go for legitimacy. So depending on how these integrity uh, 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 initiatives are formulated, uh, it could make a difference or it may not, not make. But what happens is that sometimes these uh, managers and uh, boards are able to identify the, the initiatives, put out positive uh, information in their reports and on their websites, but the real practice may not be uh, uh, the one that's, that, that that pushes the, the good for, for 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 all. So that, that, that that's the uh, an issue, maybe a, a, an area for uh, further studies. Wesley, what are what are your thoughts on whether or not uh, integrity within the cases that you saw? Would you think integrity is a is a better way to approach this? Mm. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Well, the idea that if we're thinking about civil society and um, motivating action on this, would more positive messages around integrity help? Um, well, I, I know that there's certainly a, a literature on that. And um, I think the argument in terms of uh, uh, compliance and corruption compliance uh, around you know, ethics, uh, the emphasis being on ethics rather than rules. Say, okay, you, you know, it's this wrong is um, uh, ethics and integrity. You know, if if you approach the corruption from uh, what is called the, the flow triangle theory, you know, opportunity, you know, the, the opportunity, fresh uh, rationalization, that if you put in integrity and ethics and the changes of culture, it helps to you know at the, at the stage of rationalization. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's been proved to work in some, there's empirical research to that effect, that integrity, ethics, uh, um, you know, the change of mindset and culture does help. There is actually literature 
and 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 studies have have shown that it does work. Excellent, thanks. Um, do we have any more questions coming in? Okay, Katie, please interrupt me if if there are. But it it struck me that um, there's almost the the research from all three presentations is kind of pointing to these tensions that we're seeing a lot. So one is around, you know, really thinking about who anti-corruption efforts are for. So are they for the international community um, for whatever reason to to uh, facilitate uh, an easier playing field for? Um, their own firms? Is it for uh, sending signals about what good governance is? Is it for firms themselves? Is it for the governments in more corrupt countries? Is it for citizens? Um, and so really thinking about why we do the things that we do. Um, and with that, the, re the need really to think about talking to anti-corruption actors and actually what, what they would want and what they would want to see. Um, linked to that, I, I, I saw some research recently from somebody working specifically on conflict research. This is a conflict research program at LSE. And she was talking about um, the importance of things like UNCAC for providing something for civil society to hang on to. Um, so even if it can be used as window dressing, even if it lets corrupt governments off the hook for a while, it does give uh, civil society something. Uh, like Wesley, as you said, you know, you can still fight even if the uh, the courts and institutions are weak. Um, but the one thing that she said, the exception that they found in their research is that the only time it doesn't make any difference is when organized crime is involved, and in particular drugs trafficking, and that that completely changes the dynamics where actually uh, even the presence of those uh, that, that can't overcome the challenges for civil society. And I wanted to throw it out I, to either the speakers or to any of the participants as well. When we talk about anti-corruption efforts, where do you think the challenges come in when it comes to linking this to organized crime? So I can see Jay here or Tuesday are two names that are jumping out at me as possibilities. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Luke, you say here, does anyone raise the issue of authoritarian governments capturing the anti-corruption ag agenda for political ends? Uh, for example, to crack down on political opposition or civil society with the pretext of fighting corruption, such as tax evasion, et cetera. One link with organized crime here is that these are the same governments who occasionally use organized groups or gangs as enforcers. Um, I think that's a really, uh, really important issue as well, thinking about um, the ways in which authoritarian governments also use anti-corruption platforms uh, for their own agenda and the challenges of trying to figure out what is a genuine anti-corruption uh, agenda and what's much more politically motivated as well. Luke, can I just ask you to, to follow up on that second point about the link with organized crime as well? So, sorry, did you ask me to follow up on it? Yeah, would you mind? <laughs> um, that, I, I added that because it was a bit more, uh, because I, I didn't want to be entirely off topic, but um, it's now without without um, getting into lengthy details about which, which countries, because I, I could probably cite examples in uh, on a number of continents, um, it's really more an issue of uh, the sort of interpenetration between uh, illicit and illicit governments, between uh, government uh, agencies, but also uh, organized crime groups. So the way in which they um, um, enter a political sphere and uh, capture political power through bribery or uh, coercion and so on and so forth, but also in which um, uh, politicians and, and governments uh, use organized crime for their own ends, uh, whether that's uh, self-enrichment through corruption or um, using uh, organized crime uh, uh, in order to uh, um, crack down on their, uh, on their political opponents uh, or, or others. Um, and again, I mean, this this may be too too political, perhaps, to really uh, to really fit into this present panel. 
uh, but it, it, it sprang to mind uh, quite uh, uh, quite spontaneously. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if that link is too uh, uh, too tedious or too uh, um, too thin, but uh, uh, I thought it was interesting to ask it. No, thank you very much for that. It's a really uh, it's an interesting point to end on the panel because one of the last. Uh, little notes that I had myself about, you know, what linked the the three presentations together is the the idea that anti corruption is actually highly technical. So you need real serious technical se sector expertise and so on, but it's also deeply political. And so the context is where a lot of this starts to fall apart or really come together. And I think all three presentations showed that really nicely. I think also the um, just the sense of the fact that anti-corruption comes with a lot of baggage as well and a lot of challenges around different competing incentives whether at the global the firm level uh, the national or so on um, and then finally that it's not just difficult it's also uh, really quite dangerous as well and i think uh, luke you've done a good job at, at bringing us to to that point um, as well um, and with that, I think we are out of time, um, which is uh, sad because I could talk corruption all night, um, but that was great. So if I could say uh, thank you very much to the three speakers for three great um, sort of well-timed and really, really interesting presentations. And uh, I'd like to follow up with all of you later on in that. Um, and to participants for questions and so on, and to the great facilitation um, from the Secretariat. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, and I just need to inform you that you can stay for the next session. You can leave for another Zoom room as well. Um, or in my case, you can go to bed pretty soon as well. But uh, I want to say thank you very much to everyone and have a good evening. Or if you're in uh, Australia and that region, a good morning. Thank you. <laughs>